Hello, welcome to another episode of the Wannabe Entrepreneur Podcast. Today with another interview. You see, since I have found some kind of success with PodSqueeze, that I have been thinking about the next phase of being an indie maker. The first phase is to get a product off the ground. It's just taken off and now you're actually paying your bills. That's the first phase. And there's a lot of episodes, a lot of interviews for you. If you are still in that phase, you can just go there, listen to it, and you'll get a lot of content and knowledge from makers from all around the world. But now I'm interested in the next phase. What now? Can we keep this running for a long time or will I be back to the first phase soon? How do I get the profits I'm getting from my current company and invest it properly? So that's why today I'm talking with Daniel. He is now 26 years old and is running a 500k ARR SaaS portfolio. Together with his brother, they sold their first company in their early 20s. And now they are actually reinvesting those profits into either other SaaS companies, real estate, and other assets. In this conversation, we'll discover what's Daniel's mindset on investing his portfolio and growing his wealth, and as well, what kind of assets work best for Daniel. It was a very chilled and informative conversation, and I'm excited to share that with you. So without any further ado, here's Daniel. Quite low volume, but... Uh, okay. It, is it better? Yeah, yeah it's better. Because I, I yeah, had okay. a volume to the max, and I, I couldn't hear too much, so I thought it might be... You also have a podcast, right? Yeah, I haven't been recording in a bit, to be honest, because uh, I started traveling at one point, and I just... Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. The thing is, I was doing the podcast, and I told this to the guest as well. I just said... Um, I want to just uh, get free advice and drain you out of information. And instead mm-hmm. of you having a one-on-one call with me, if they even wanted to do that, because some people wouldn't, most, uh, let's just record it. We'll put it out there on the internet and uh, other people can hear it too. And yeah. yeah. So I use it for, for kind of like a selfish purpose, but I was upfront about it. So I, I hope that made it a well, bit better. I, I've done exactly the same yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. this podcast. I've, yeah. I've talked with a lot of people, a lot of makers, and I don't know, for me, I feel it was the best, you know, course on entrepreneurship. Yeah. Because I, I got to speak with, again, people from mostly bootstrappers, but people that were um, quite advanced, that were making a lot of money, people that were not making a lot of money, and yeah, I, was, I just asked all my selfies, selfish questions, and uh, well, it turns out that a lot of people have the same questions, so that's why you know it. It also works in a format for a podcast, but uh, yeah, for me, it was mm-hmm. like the best way to learn, uh, the best course I could ever ask. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do, do you feel the same? Uh, about the same, to be honest. Yeah. Um, initially, I did a couple of AMAs in uh in Twitter Spaces. I guess they're called X spaces now. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I did yeah, that. I hate that. I hate that they <laughs> changed the name. It makes no sense. Right? I mean, people are, people are still going to call it Twitter for a few years, to be honest. More than sure. But yeah. uh, I'm uh, trying to correct yeah. myself to to be, you know, changing with the times, to not become old and grumpy. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> it doesn't work. Sometimes it works. So yeah. So yeah, I did a couple of Twitter spaces, AMAs, because I also have a community, Reddit SAS. So we would have a text AMA. Mm-hmm. I would just set it up for the for the people. Yeah. And then we would also start it as a live Twitter spaces. So I used those for the podcast. And then I just did one-on-ones because then I got tired and bored. I mean, not bored, but it just I didn't have that much motivation to do the Twitter spaces anymore. Mm-hmm. Then I did a podcast. Then uh, I just, uh, yeah, I started traveling and put my head down, started working and just didn't get down to recording podcasts. I guess I would do it with some people. Like I invited Peter Levels a couple of weeks ago. He didn't get back to me, but that's fine. I know he's busy yeah. and everything. So uh, I would do it it's for hard. some people. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So man, I had a, I had a chat with Levels with I know, Peter Levels I know. here. Yeah. And I think I, yeah, I got my rap, my uh, Spotify wrapped stats, and it was like a thousand percent more listens than any other episode. <laughs> <laughs> a thousand percent. That's crazy. Yeah. But how how was uh, how is he? How, how how was the chat with him? 
I mean, I did listen to a few bits of the episode, but I'm asking you, like, personally, Man, how did it, it feel was for you? Super weird. Like, really? He is so, no, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was uh, that was super nice. I mean, I was kind of a little bit nervous uh, because I think he's is a celebrity in in our world. Uh, it's kind of I don't know. I always compare him to the Elon Musk of bootstrapping <laughs> and indie making because like whatever he, he tweets, you know, just sells and and people like it and and share it. Yeah, and that's cr- crazy traction. So, nobody was like very down to earth, very cool. I mean, it was a really fun conversation. It went a lot like philosophical. Yeah. Maybe if I would go back now and I tried again to get him in the podcast uh, again multiple times because there's so many questions, you know, mm-hmm. like I would try to get more into, I don't know, it, it was hard to extract the sec- the secrets. Yeah. yeah. You know? Because it seemed very much intuition to him. So I would always try to figure out, yeah, but why did this work? Why did you do this <laughs> like that? I don't know. I just did it. Uh, but it's crazy because whatever he does has so much more traction than even like even the interview. Like even the when I interviewed and I got here, like people with similar audience on Twitter, you know. I just got Andrew Gazdecki, for instance, that also has 200,000 followers on Twitter. But it's, yeah, it's just not the same. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, I'm curious if his, uh, the fact that he was living in Asia, I mean, he is living in Asia for such a long time, impacted him in that way when it comes to intuition. Because I've heard that from people. And I guess even in books, even, I think even in the Steve Jobs uh, biography, uh, there was some mention about, you know, people in, in Asia have much more of an intuition driven living lifestyle as opposed to the westerns which are maybe too technical too objective too rational and whatever so i'd be curious to be if 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 that may have had any impact Mm. uh and yeah other than that you know what surprises me about him tell me he's if i'm not mistaken 39 he might be turning 40 next Mm. year and he looks he looks young as fuck yeah he does i mean it 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 did look like he aged a bit you know ever since 20 15, 16, but he still looks young. He doesn't look 40 or 39 yeah, yeah, yeah. or 38, whatever. He looks 28. He looks a bit mature now. Yeah, I think it's definitely connected to the lifestyle. It's also genetics, I would say, but definitely connected to the lifestyle. Yeah. You know, because of him, I started looking more into, um, uh, how do you call it? I'll just call it bio, like beef that is, you know, grass-fed, free-roaming, mm. everything. I think <laughs> of him. I think of him. I'm like... <laughs> No, I can see that you're also a fanboy. I mean, uh, I am too. <laughs> I, I, he's a huge inspiration. And yeah. the fact that he does it, uh, eff- not effortlessly, I know he puts in effort, but naturally, as, as you pointed out, uh, I think that's, and I think that can inspire any human being that is and doesn't have, you know, as long as it doesn't play into any insecurity. If anybody would meet a person like him who is very open and, you know, doesn't have anything to hide, says what, what they think, I feel like people generally not only appreciate but can get inspired by that. Yeah. I did, and I'm trying to integrate that within myself as much mm-hmm. as I can. So, uh, yeah, anyway, I mean, inspiration is so rare these days that when you find someone that just spews off inspiration, I'm like, okay, get me hooked. I, I want to yeah. see more. I want to find out more. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Speaking about inspiration, what other guests, What what was the main thing that you learned from your interviews. I know that you got, you know, Daniel Vassallo, for instance, uh, and a few others. Yeah. People that, you know, had a lot of success. What would, like, if you could now write down a few lessons that you took from these interviews that now you are applying to your own SaaS and your own projects, what would that be? I would say, first thing, it might not be directly related to SaaS, but um, it's pe- these people that I've talked to, which are my heroes, think in simpler terms than uh, than one would think. So I thought, you know, if I, m- maybe it was a common trope because I was younger, I was 23, I mean, now I'm 26, so 23, 24 when I yeah, started. Yeah, that's also something crazy, man. You're super young. You yeah. started, I did your pin tweet, uh, what does it say? It says, I'm 23 and I made $200,000, yeah, 200000 100% online last year with my younger brother or 17, uh, you know, years yeah. old. 
uh, and we are not done. So that was in 2021, yeah. and so it's two years later, so you're 25. Oh, uh, I just turned 26. I, I'm I'm born late. 26 throughout the year. So yeah, I okay. just I recently turned 26. Oh, okay, then you're old. Then forget <laughs> about it. <laughs> cancel everything. Yeah, the cancel interview. whatever I was saying. <laughs> uh, so that's 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 really cool. I mean, it's it's refreshing. Uh, I am I am 31 now. So okay. I started my journey at 28. Yeah. Uh, my you know indie journey. You're still young. And. Uh, well, thank you. You know, once once you get to the thirties, it, it changes your mind a bit. But I heard. That. I mean, it's uh, but it's it's cool. It's cool that you have you know you're so so young and already doing this kind of stuff and learning this kind of stuff, right? Because I feel that I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, and I only really started learning at twenty eight, mm-hmm. uh, which is fine. I mean, you can always start at any age, really. But yep. now you started a bit younger, so that's that's cool. What my feeling is. When it comes, because I've also talked about this age topic quite a bit with people. What I think doesn't get said from people from my side is if you're or if you start later in life, if you start at an older age than I did, because mm-hmm. I can't speak about my experience. What doesn't get said is the fact that you also you, the more mature person, you also get to jump faster and further than i did so what took what may might have took uh, what what takes me five years to learn might have only taken you two years because you also have your experience or look at daniel vasallo he went as an overnight success quote unquote Mm -hmm. um but obviously all his past experience and maybe even interacting maybe maybe even having kids in the first place gets him to learn faster because he has all that from behind right. so yeah again what what took me eight years might have taken him one year or maybe yeah. even less than that yes yeah. so i think stuff evens out obviously you also have less time to enjoy the rewards but that's a separate discussion and uh yeah um so even though i started earlier it also took me longer so i think in a okay. way it kind mm-hmm. of evens itself out somehow interesting okay yeah that's interesting yeah. i would think it would be actually the opposite you know younger you are it's easier to, you know, change your mind. But uh, yeah, I mean, in the end, it just, you need to want it really much. Like you need to, because it's so much work <laughs> that it's great. Sometimes I like, I compare myself with, you know, a couple of my friends that are not indie makers. And for me, because I love it, you know, there's no plan B. I just loved um, the whole like entrepreneurship business and and being my own boss mm-hmm. that it doesn't doesn't really seem like work it's more joy but yeah it's a lot of work it was a lot of like you know banging my head against the wall and figuring figuring things out and learning and adapting so yeah in the end you just need to put the work yeah. and yeah yeah and and that's so, the thing that's the thing if if you are older than 20 or whatever, like a very fragile age. So I'll give an example. Uh, 20 something, at one point, we just burned some serious money. I estimate mm-hmm. about 100,000 in products that nobody wanted, nobody asked for, nobody ever used. So that was because of that. Does hubris mean what I think it means? So, kind of some sort of an arrogance, hubris, excessive pride or self confidence. Okay. It was because of okay. hubris. Uh, and maybe if you start at 30, you will, you will avoid that mistake because you've already been schooled by life in a, in a different place, maybe at work, maybe with mm. your girlfriend, maybe with your friends. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think this is a better example, practical example of stuff that, you know, you, you have your baggage from behind, your lessons yeah. and, and everything. Maybe how if did, I would have started... How did you lose? How did you lose 100,000? Oh, we just invested in products. So that's all the whole 100,000 that I estimate is just in salaries of developers because we do everything else, product development, design, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was just developer salaries and developers aren't cheap. Uh, Right. A Mm -hmm. couple of products, I don't know, I don't know if three, maybe five. It it was just money that went uh, to nothing. Like we made stuff, people didn't use. And at one point we even made stuff we didn't even release. Because we realized halfway through, like, okay, okay, nobody asked for this, nobody validated it. I mean, we didn't. So yeah. yeah. Um, and when, what, what's your background? So are you like developer? Are you marketing, no, design? I'm not technical. I don't know how to code. I mm. started by doing graphic design, and okay. slowly, because of the need, you know, because of the business, I uh, expanded into UI, UX, like product design. 
and product okay. development. So I've had to learn because I because I employed developers. I I, I didn't know it was called product development or I don't mm-hmm. even know what it's called now. I think it's product development or product management. Uh, I just I, I just got a better feeling at telling, you know, because of trial and error, because of talking to my developers and them telling me this is possible, this is impossible, this takes a week, this takes a year. I just got a better feeling, you know, w- with time uh, about what can be done and what cannot be done. Mm-hmm. And I, sh- I sure still have a, a lot to learn and I'm not formally trained. I don't know if I would be able to work in a, in a startup or in a scale up or at Spotify as a product manager. But uh, I think this is the closest thing out of what I've heard. This is the closest thing to what I do in the, mm-hmm. in the company. Okay. Got it. So back to what I've learned from talking to some of my heroes on the podcast. Yeah. They think in simpler terms than I estimated or that people might think. So sometimes you look at people that you admire and you, you think, Oh shit, they've got it all figured out and they just know, and they just do this thing, and that happens mm-hmm. kind of like like the same way you read biographies or stories. It's not really like that. And what I've seen, for instance, from Jason Fried, is that he's uh, uh, he's he's very comfortable with what he says and thinks. And sure, one could say, okay, he's already got it all, or you could say the same about Peter Levels. He's got it all figured out. Obviously, it's easier for him. But it's some sort of a self feeding circle. The same way uh, Peter Levels talks about. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says something along the lines of, it's not that I'm making sales because I have followers or mm-hmm. I make new products that sell instantly. It's it's the, the whole reason is because I make new shit that I put it out and something, some, some of these things work and some doesn't, uh, some don't. And um, yeah, that gets me followers. It's a self-feeding circle. It's not A or B. It's A and B and A and B. So Mm. back to the point I was making, they don't have it all figured out either. They just do. Maybe they, maybe it's even an undoing. Maybe they just don't think that much in a way and they just do. The same way if you do any kind of sport, basketball. Yeah. Yeah. You just shoot and shoot and shoot. And sure, maybe with time you learn tactics and everything. But if you don't have your jump shot, you know, close to perfection, there's no point in learning tactics and complex stuff. You know, that's true, but I also think that's where intuition comes into play, right? Because your muscle memory, when, you, when you're when you playing basketball, uh, at some point, because you sh- you did that so much, like you just have the muscle, muscle memory to always shoot. And that doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing. Maybe you don't know that you are doing it. And that's what I, well, with my chat again with Peter Levels, that's what I felt, you know, like, yeah, I just felt that there was some intuition there, and and that's I was I was even discussing this with my co-founder because we learn alone, right? Like with the podcast and everything. So uh, there's no course like w- when you go to college or um, you take any course, you have a, li- a limited time of, a time, right? And they say, okay, after this one year, and after completing this, you know, test exams, you'll get this degree. Mm-hmm. So you feel that, okay, I've achieved something. But when you're learning, like we are, yeah. you know, with the school of life <laughs> and learning with, with, with people, we don't realize. We're just learning and applying and testing things. Some things fail, we realize, but we don't acknowledge it, right? Because we don't say, okay, we passed the development yeah, yeah. <laughs> product. We passed the not spend too much money um, exam. No, we don't realize. So that at some point, it just gets intuition. And especially if you work alone, you don't get to share this, right? So people with Peter Levels is alone. So I, I, I bet that there's not a lot of people. So he, also, he also doesn't do a lot of interviews. So I guess there's not a lot of people that say, like, hey, Peter, why are you doing like this? Why are you not doing like that? Uh, so I feel that they just get, you know, into them. And they yeah. don't understand that they have a lot of knowledge that most of us don't. So, yeah. There's no uh, ceremony, yeah. there's no degree, there's no paper you get. Yeah, and also to yeah, your yeah. point about muscle memory, because when you said college or university, I thought of the 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 uh, kind of the same point as yours about muscle memory in basketball. It's kind of like an exam. When if if you stuff information in your brain the night before the exam, it might matter, it might not. But the thing is, when you take the exam, it's not that one night before the exam. It's it's all the nights when you were studying. Combined, mm-hmm. so you you have. I, I suppose you're already ready if you studied timely. You mm-hmm. you the, the performance of your exam is the sum, the average, the whatever, the median, the mean, 
I don't know yeah. the term, of the, of the whole block of nights or days when you've learned summed up in one day. So, and I guess the same about business, like your next product is going to be influenced by all the past products and companies or businesses you've, yeah, uh, you've yeah, made in the past. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, I'm curious to know about how everything started for you. Why did you come up, come to this world of indie making? Uh, I started, I made my first money when I was 12. I started my first online business when I was 15 and it was an online shop. I don't know okay. what, what moved me from e-commerce into SaaS, but I'm very thankful for whatever that was. because. <laughs> and actually, no, in between SaaS and the first business, of which was e-commerce, I started, I could have also gone, you know, fate-wise, I could have gone down the path of mobile apps. And I'm also very thankful I didn't go down that route because it's, it also looks like a painful, mm-hmm. possibly painful, stressful, or at least not as stress-free as SaaS uh, path. So, yeah, started that. The, but this specific uh, path of the journey, uh, in very simple terms, started when I was 2017. Yeah, 19. Yeah, okay. when I was 19, I started this free app, mobile app, okay. which is uh, part of the main company that still exists today, Legit Check. Um, I thought it was a side project for two years. And then I realized, oh, shit, it's a business. Started making some money with it. Uh, I started making more money and wanted to divest. And when we were looking at what we could divest in, like, you mm-hmm. know, starting different business, just if this one fails, right. we, um, I just liked SaaS. And I kind of had, you know, some implication with SaaS back from the design world, back when I was doing design uh, as a freelancer. So, because um, in, in those two years when this app was okay. just a side project, I earned my existence, you know, by, by doing freelance design. So, But uh, you never worked in a company for others. You just, like, did freelance and you, you were always kind of your own boss. I worked at Michael Kors on Regent Street for a month and a bit because okay. I was in uni. So back to your question, I also did university. I had a okay. gap year. In that gap year, I thought I would never do college or university, but then I mm-hmm. changed my mind, so I did it. And in uni, at one point, I don't know what kind of movie was playing yeah. in my head. It was, it was a bit dumb, but it was fun. I mean, it wasn't dumb. It was just stuff you do when you're younger, I guess. I thought to myself, Jesus, I like the fashion world. I want to get more exposed to the fashion yeah. world. What should I do? I know. I'll just work at one of the fashion stores, obviously. So I yeah. just went around, passed my CV, got accepted into Michael Kors, um, J. Crew, and Guess. But I wanted to work at like Burberry or Gucci or whatever. Mm. So uh, yeah, Michael Kors accepted. I said, this is the closest thing I could get to Burberry or something like that. Then I worked there for a month and a bit. And then I got bored. Oh, and that everyone, was long. <laughs> every, everyone, yeah, everyone told me off. So I ran out of managers that, that would just tell me off because I would be maybe late. Maybe I just didn't treat it seriously. So, and and you, okay. they, had, they had to have that kind of like a military attitude. Like you just... Yeah. You're like, oh, shit, they're seeing me. Uh-huh. And I was like, like, I would be on my phone looking at apps during some training. And they'll be like, what are you doing? Yeah. And I would just be honest. I, I, I said, I was looking on the app store. And they're like, for what purpose? Uh-huh. And I said, well, I'm, I'm looking to start a new app. And I was just looking at this one. <laughs> and it, 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 it was a bit, it was arrogant. I'm not going to lie. And it was unprofessional. But yeah. I was okay if they would fire me. And eventually they didn't fire me because... Uh, I mean, they probably would have, but Christmas was coming, and they needed people. Right. And I just so you were selling in the stores. Yeah, no, I was a cashier, but I would okay. also be selling if if there wouldn't be any, you know, traffic, like okay. a lot of traffic. If there yeah. wouldn't be any queue. I would be selling as well. I sold the bag. I sold one of the most expensive bags at one point. It was about a thousand pounds. Yeah, I, I nice. got lucky. It wasn't my skill. <laughs> I got lucky. <laughs> Is this something you learn? I mean, it's only a month. Right? Yeah, but a month and a bit. This, month and a bit. Is this something that you learned that you can apply in life? Uh, I Don't never thought fashion, of it. Maybe. <laughs> I ne- uh, <laughs> well, the thing is, I didn't get into fashion as I thought. Yeah. I got into sales because I didn't do any that's designing true. or anything like that. But that's that. really important, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it is. It is. But uh, me at the end of the job and me at the beginning of the job, uh, it were like two different people because, uh, like, two different opinions. Sorry, because I was like, mm. well, shit. This wasn't fashion. I should have thought. Yeah. I I, sh- I should have realized that before doing right. it. But yeah, something I learned. I don't know. Maybe intuition. 
Maybe so. Maybe I, maybe I learned something intuitive. Yeah, maybe you learned something intuitive. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Okay. Have, have you? Have you had jobs or what? What were? You, what, what was your life before the indie world? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a software developer. So oh shit, that's good. I just I just worked for you know software companies. I worked for a bigger company called Trivago in I Germany. Know. What was that like? Uh, yeah, traveling, uh, hotel isn't search. It? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hotel search. Yeah, I mean, most people know it, which is cool. <laughs> it's yeah, it's good to. It's easy to say. Yeah, they did a lot of marketing, and then I worked for a smaller startup, also in the travel industry, and then I, you know, I started my indie journey. So I had like, I think it was like what six years of experience working yeah. for others. Mm -hmm. Um, before that, I also did some, you know, other jobs. Like, I don't know, selling vacuum cleaners for a bit. Oh, shit. That's and good. Into sales. That's very so good. So a little bit of sales as well. But mm -hmm. not a lot. It was the same as you. Like, not a, not a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard when you're an entrepreneur. And also even, like, it's funny because every time I worked for others, like other software companies, I would always default to being an entrepreneur. And always mm -hmm. like, hey, let me try build this feature. Let's, and I, with Trivago, I, built, I did build a few cool projects that never worked out. But... oh. Uh, it was a harsh reality as well because I, I realized that no one most, well, at least in my experience, they didn't want an entrepreneur. They were like, no, Tiago, I want you to do what you're told. And now that I'm also employing you know, freelancers to build code, I also, I mean, I, I they are entrepreneurs, they're indie makers, they have their own projects, but I don't want them to, have, because this is mine, you know, this is my project. And, I, and I, of course, I, I like for them to have, you know, um, creativity and critical thinking. But in the end, there's a, f a set of features that I want them to do, right? So I understand that most companies, they don't want you... Like, if they only had entrepreneurs, that they would never go anywhere because there'll be like, so many random shit. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I just... I was always defaulting to entrepreneurship. So then I realized, yeah, fuck it. I need to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but well, it, it's it's interesting that your, your mindset as well, because you started... Uh, this this app, and then you started thinking on, of, you said divesting and investing in multiple stuff. Um, I don't know that that's a business mind. You know, that's, that's something that I'm only now starting to think. Okay, wh what shall we do? And and I see that you have like small real estate projects as well that you invest. Um, I don't know wh what's your goal. Like, wh what's your goal with all of this? It's just like to make tons of money. Is it, I don't know, to get some freedom, just to show everyone that you that you can do it? Like, what's your main goal with this? It comes out of uh, some flavor of fear or paranoia or uh, safety or, sorry, a need for safety. Okay. So, um, see, back when I was, and I was just talking this the other day to my brother, who is my co-founder in absolutely everything. Um Back when, back to the tweet, like 22, 23, making 200,000 a year, we, we never enjoyed any of that money. The proof being we, we spent 100K just yeah. in, the, in, the, in the stupid shit. So uh, we never enjoyed any of it at that point because we were like, well, I don't know how much this is going to last. Like, I suppose this also comes, you know, the, the, the more you, you break into this situation and the mindset and whatever. Uh, but I thought I, I, I didn't make plans as if this was going to last up until today, let alone 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Mm. So, and uh, yeah, it comes out, out of a certain flavor of, or at least it used to come out of a certain flavor of fear or need for resources stacked as a backup and everything. Mm. Now I am, I've been working on it and I think I'm, I still choose to keep that mindset because I think you kind of need that as a as a man as a male uh you need to be mindful of it like it, it's a very sad story of the person who made a lot of resources let's not just say money let's just say resources and they blew it all up or they just weren't prepared and they got washed away when a metaphorical tsunami came like a black swan mm. economy event or whatever um so yeah that's on one side and about the business mindset i realized this at one point so my parents both had businesses, but mm -hmm. I'm, we're not coming from a rich family. So my parents did that, but then they got into a bad situation for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we, we didn't grow up in it. I, I thought I was poor for a long time. I later realized we weren't really poor. We just didn't have any kind of luxury. Like we're right. 
Low in, middle class, maybe. Low middle class to maybe middle class at one point. But I was okay. very young when we were middle class. So it's not like I got any expensive sneakers or any shit like mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah. So so you're afraid to, to also like lose your business because of that? That's on one side. And on the other side, I th- so I think it's a weird cocktail. I, I, I've had like a weird cocktail sort of, a, sort of childhood where it was that. And also the fact that, so on one hand, my parents seeing, seeing them lose shit, I was like, oh, fuck, never want to get back to that again. But at the same time, both of them had businesses. Um, and I, up until one point, I thought business was the only way to go about it. It was only one day when I, and I realized, oh, shit. You could get a job and sure, you invest <laughs> eight hours of your day, but um, yeah. but you have your living paid off. So in case shit goes down, I can always get a job, hopefully, but you know, like minimum wage, United Kingdom, the, the government takes care of you and everything. So I was like, fuck, man, there's always this option. Like, I'm not dying on the streets. That's great. I mean, obviously, you know, you could get a job, but. You know, I got a job at Michael Kors. I was like, okay, they're paying me this, and I can yeah. work this, and I can do part-time. But it's a shitty job, right? Uh, yeah, but I you, think, ex- you don't exchange the job with money. You exchange the job with your soul. <laughs> no, it depends <laughs> on the job, right? With but your yeah, time. Some, some, with your time. Job, Let's call it that. Yeah, some, I think sometimes it's also with your soul a little bit. You know, you it just drains all the energy. Like, if you're an entrepreneur, I don't know. Once you get into this, and I, I agree with you, and that's a great point you know like you're a freelancer as well you can always get clients you can always get a job uh maybe now it's easier than than in your parents time and my parents time uh because now it's virtually and you can you know you have some the world to to be your client but um yeah at some point i you we can we kind of become unemployable and at least i feel that like man i don't want to do anything else i don't want to work for others anymore uh, yeah, once you taste it, you don't want to go back. But yeah. at the same time, this thing with the job, uh, the reason why it didn't scare me was even... That, so I, I, I treated it as a backup. And obviously, it, that's still possible throughout my lifetime. I don't know where life will take me. Sure, Hopefully yeah. not there. But uh, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. e- even, if, yeah, yeah. even if you get a job, it doesn't have to be permanent. You could be like, okay, I don't know if it's going to be two or six months, but I know it's not going to be for long because yeah. I'll figure something out eventually. Yeah. Worst case, worst. So you're trying to... Uh, understand what happened in the case of your parents and how can you avoid it? Right? Like, how can you grow? Because there's there's a lot... I mean, business is super hard. You yeah. know, most people end up losing their business or even if they have their business, and it's, it's a lifestyle business that never pays more than like an average wage, right? And I, I am at the same boat, by the way. I identify myself with you in a lot of things. Uh, and then what I wonder is like, okay, but how... Can we make sure that this doesn't happen to us? How can we make sure that we follow the path or the millionaires, you know? Uh, and and I'm not even saying billionaires. I think that's too much. But, you know, a couple of million. Like, how can we make sure? Because once you reach, whatever, five million, I mean, you're set. You don't need anything. You just you put the money in some kind of S&P and you have enough money to live, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, yep. nice, a nice life. So how... Do you have any answers, like, or what is your strategy to to reach there that point? I can walk you through what what I so far up until my life, much like anything I said. I can walk you through what I've concluded for now, and sure. I hope I'll be right. We'll we'll, we'll do another <laughs> we'll podcast see. in twenty years, and yeah, we'll see yeah. <laughs> part two. How um, is Michael Kors in <laughs> twenty years? They're like, oh my, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, joking. Um, so. My parents got there because of bad debt, really yeah. bad debt, and uh, debt. And I suppose, you know, it wasn't legal clauses. Anyways, just just call it bad debt. And yeah, so I'm avoiding debt like the plague. And I might be yeah. too, I might be too cautious sometimes, but I'm fine with that. So, for instance, you know, I, I, we recently had our first acquisition. We exited the uh, Simple Dot Inc. So yeah, a significant part that. of that money went into, you know, just ETF, S&P, like you said. That, that we, we call it our, uh, my brother and I call it our pension. And right, yeah. Besides that, we're also not, I mean, we, we did get a prize for ourselves, like a tiny thing, but um, we didn't buy a G-Class Mercedes or anything like that. We're looking to buy a business. I suppose if that business goes well, um, we'll, we might be getting a car or something like that. 
But uh, so I'm overly cautious. But the reason, and this is what the point I was trying to get to, the reason why we do this is because we are not looking specifically to make billions, like you said. If that happens, fine. If not, doesn't matter. Uh, but what we're looking to do is stay in the game for as long as possible. Because if you do that, so I'm a very big fan of slow and steady over long term rather than mm -hmm. burst. Because the same way you, you grow, it might be the same way you might fall. So I'm not looking to make one-time wonder hits. If that happens without me trying, fine, I guess, with, as a discussion about faith and religion and whatever. But um, if you come to me now and say, look, I'll just get you something that gets you 100% yield and in six months you get your mind back and then just prints millions, I don't, want, I don't even want to hear about it because right. the risk is too high. And I'm not looking to win. I'm looking to not lose. And if, mm. I, if, if, if I manage to do what I've done before, which is make, get lucky, make one-hit wonders and whatever, that's fine. It can happen. Okay. But Makes other than sense. that, and I'm looking at that in, in relationships as well. I, I would be, so for instance, we're looking to, on this acquisition, we're looking to partner up with the people that acquired our company. You might, somebody might come with a better deal or I might meet this crazy entrepreneur that might be the next Elon Musk. I don't really want to hear about it because if, if it goes wrong, I'm losing too much or maybe right. even everything. If I've got the bandwidth to risk something like that, to do maybe angel investing, 50K in 100 projects, I might be doing it if I have the foundation to be able to lose it. At the moment, I don't. And okay. it's the reason why we exited our product. Some people told mm -hmm. me, you're exiting too early. You're not reaping the benefits. You're whatever. You don't get any equity. What if they grow it to mm -hmm. 10x that and you don't get 100x that? Mm -hmm. But I was fine because we didn't have a foundation. Now we have a sort of foundation. Okay. And yeah, it just feels so safer. The, the product that you exit, uh, si simple, dot ink right it yeah. was a it was a tool to help make websites out of notion correct, correct. yeah um so yeah let, let's go through this process so it was acquired on acquire.com uh, yes which is cool because i just like my last interview as i told you was andrew gazdecki the founder of acquire.com yeah um so how much were you making like what was your um, arr once you listed it i'm i'm i feel bad every time i say it because i used to share all the shit in public on Twitter, but because of the confidentiality clause, I cannot do it. Uh, Can you give us like an interval? Yeah. Or the the only thing I've managed to negotiate out of the contract was I can say it was six figures. Okay. And it was, okay. a, uh, what was the wording? Something like a comfortable or life-changing exit. I have to respect the clause, especially since I'm looking to partner up with these people. And they're actually great people. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. That, that's all I can say, sadly. And so, it's, every time I used to hear this on interviews, I was like, fuck you, man. You just don't want to tell us. And now I understand how it feels. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. No, I guess in the uh, next exit, the thing is, by the point we got there... I wonder why they don't want it. Like, why can't you share it? Like, what's the... I think it's a matter of deal? preference. Like, some people are... So, because when you're building... They're more public, private. Yeah, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. The same way you are. So, I know you understand me on this one. When you're building in public, you're like, man, I shared 80% of all the numbers and everything. What's the difference if I do 90% or even 100%? Right. But uh, up until you make that step, you might want to keep stuff private. Maybe, you know, just attitude, age, generation, whatever. Yeah. We grew up with all this shit on the internet. We grew up with... So we were looking at up to Peter Levels who were sharing this. this they true. they yeah. didn't. So they, they weren't like, okay, inspiration, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm going to do it like them. So, yeah. Yeah, my co-founder is not very happy that I share so much, to be honest. Who's that? Uh, my co-founder is not very happy that I shared so much. Oh, uh, oh. So, <laughs> but yeah, I do. But yeah, anyways, it doesn't, doesn't matter. My, I guess my question is like, why did you decide to sell it? Like, what what, what was going on? Was like, you just, it was get, getting boring or I don't, you thought that, no, I don't want to, I want to do something else or I don't know how to scale this. What was it? It was a couple of things, some of the things you've mentioned. So, first of all, we got a great offer. And I was like, because we listed it on Acquire. Yeah, but like even, even before deciding to list it, right? Like, that, yeah. uh, that's what I'm curious about. I was like, well, shit, the business is going well. It's stable. It got to a point because I feel like, and I see this now, I'll give a quick example of milestones of business. And obviously, there's more. But after a certain number of MRR, you have the, you are able to hire a developer. So you open right. up to a new audience. For instance, I, I can't be buying, you see this on Acquire, and I just, uh, I closed the, the tab, but that's for me. 
for developers. So sometimes people say 1.5K revenue per month, 1.3K profit per month because of $200 right. running costs. That's not the case for me. I need to hire at least one developer. So I don't have the bandwidth to hire a developer in that amount of monthly recurring revenue. If you're a developer, that might be true, but then you don't factor in your time, but I don't either. So that's fine. Uh, I'm, not follow, I, I'm not a fan of mm. that thing of, oh yeah, but you didn't factor in your time. I don't care. I just work. So it's mm. fine. Yeah. Um, so back to what, so yeah, we listed it. We wanted to see what would happen. We wanted, we, we, the business was, was at a stable point and I was like, well, shit, maybe we'll get a great offer. And we did. It, it just happened. Okay. It was a bit of a mistake because we only listed on Acquire. If I would be selling a company now, I would be set, I would be posting it even in the residential complex next to me. I would just be putting signs okay. you know, because the more offers you have, I'm exaggerating, but the more offers you have, the more you can make them bid for you. Yeah. So that's great. You, you just want a sea of options. Yeah. No, that's it. exactly what Andrew said in, in my interview. Actually, yeah. When I asked him, it's like, yeah, you need just... So what, what do you do? Like you, you got a few offers and you just like, you ask, say, okay, can you give more? <laughs> Is that it? Like, I had two offers, but what if I had five? Because then it's like a, like a genetic testing of some shit, yeah. or like A-B testing of some sort. So you, you, you are fine going to them. It's like, hey, I know I said 100K, but can you give 200? Is that fine? No, I, I was just honest. I said, look, we have this other offer and it's at this. And if you give, if you, if you would offer 10, 20% more, honestly, I wouldn't be doing because they, they look like great people. And yeah, we, it was a bit of a, not bidding war. It didn't go too much. Uh, I also go, I also went with the gut feeling. So the people we went with, they look like great people, very trustworthy. Mm. And it looked like a great cultural fit. Like they, right. w- they went trust first. And I even asked right. them after we saw, I was like, look, you trusted me a lot. And because now in this other acquisition, I'm like, you know, it, it, it feels like I, I knew my acquisition was a dream acquisition and you were a dream acquirer, but like, what what made you trust us? Mm. And they said, look, you were honest with everything. You were open. You told us even the stuff we didn't ask about that we should have known. And besides that, and maybe this is a piece of advice for anyone listening, they liked the fact that we had a lot of content, a lot of video content. And my video content, don't okay. give me, it wasn't Netflix style documentary. It was right. literally Loom videos. Uh, you don't even need a camera with like background blur and you don't yeah. even see yourself that much in that bubble. But get your iPhone. It has that function where you can use your camera from your iPhone as a camera for the Loom recording. So you get okay. that background blur behind. You look a bit professional. Get some natural light or some light. And the fact that we had 40 or 50 videos where my face was showing the product, they said that mattered a lot because it, and across different moments in time, but I think that was optional. They said that got, got them a lot of trust because it looked like mm. I was into the product. They saw my face. And they didn't say this, but, you know, it's kind of like if you buy from a SaaS male guy or Tiago, obviously mm-hmm. it's way better to, to see Tiago and his face. Yeah. And he has a podcast. Great. He, oh, and he talked to Andrew Gazdick and Peter Levels. Yeah. You, you might not quantify Personal branding. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. immediately create more trust in that, right? Yeah. One quick correction, in, in my opinion. It doesn't have to be about personal branding because, and I'm, I, I have to hammer this home because this used to deter me when I didn't have a personal brand and yeah. I'm not a fan of it, but you don't even, you, you could even have three views. It doesn't matter. Your face is out there and I get you trust. So yeah. it's not, a, it's not about branding. Uh, and again, I mentioned it because it might discourage people when they hear that wording, even if no, you get zero yeah. views, no, yeah, and yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's only your acquirer that sees you or your customer that might move the needle in a way you don't even estimate. That's a very good point. That's a very interesting advice. So, uh, again, I'm another thing that Andrew said in the interview that you need that, this trust, this face to face, and he also mentioned that like if you have videos explaining the product, that will go a, a long way. Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. And what, like, um, tell me about the due diligence. Like, is there something that you would do different now? Uh, something that annoyed you? Uh, something that you you're surprised by, like okay, you you want to yeah. do this? Like, uh, what is it? Nothing that was that would have done differently because again, it, we had the dream acquisition because it took us two weeks from the moment we signed the LOI, not the asset purchase agreement, which is the final doc. We had two weeks between. Wait, what's the LOI? LOI is a letter of intent. So okay. if if I'll, mm. if I'll be buying a product from you. I would send you an LOI, which means formally we are interested in buying your company. 
It's not legally okay. binding. Both you and I can exit at any point, but it prohibits you from uh, talking to other people, presumably, about Okay. Selling the company, and it marks my interest. And we have some sort of figures which are negotiable. I mean, nothing is set in stone yet, but it's mm. some sort. It, it makes it more formal than an email or like a Twitter message. You know, it's signed okay. and everything. So yeah. LOI is that, and then between the LOI and the APA asset purchase agreement, which is the big document, that's the big okay. signing date. You get the due diligence part. So LOI, DD, APA. In the DD. Okay. What happens very briefly is the buyer looks at every single corner of your app if they choose to do so. Some people might be more intuition driven uh, mm -hmm. and they basically validate, hey, is what this person showed us so far, are the Stripe screenshots accurate? Did they get any weird transactions? Mm -hmm. Like is 80% of the revenue coming from one customer? Hmm, weird. What, are, are the costs the ones they said? Are they matching our math? Anyway, so... What surprised me during the, the due diligence was the fact that these people were, were very trustworthy. And it took us two weeks from okay. the date of the first signature to the moment the money reached our bank account. Um, oh, that's crazy. Two weeks. Yeah. And we also that had bank holidays. There was also a couple like Labor Day, I think, in, okay. the, in the US. So I think it could have gone even faster. But um, I was 24-7 available because I, I, they even said at one point, Jesus, dude, thank you for replying so fast every yeah. time. And I was like, I want to be the uh, seller I want to deal with one day. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's the least I can do. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think this this was more of their credit than mine. I was just there, you know, like okay, monkey at a keyboard, just typing, <laughs> putting out stuff I already knew. Well, it wasn't that hard. Uh, and I just turned off notifications, turned on notifications for them. <laughs> and then once you once you sell, sold it, um, do you still have to do something with them? Do you still like need to work for them for a while to do the transition or not so much? It depends on what you agree with them. Uh, what standard probably is you commit to a month of doing up to five hours a week of support. But it, okay. it's not customer support if you choose. If you, I did it because I wanted to make sure there's no friction for our users, for our customers. Right. But um, you have that uh, because you kind of do like organ transplant. And <laughs> they might need some, you know, transition help after the acquisition. I mean, you do that beforehand as well, but they might need to ask you shit like, hey, mm. um, what is this? What is that? Yeah. And I even help them afterwards because obviously it's my baby. And I think any entrepreneur would want to do that. You want your right. baby to succeed. It, it will course. always be tied to your names. Tesla founders. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Elon Musk. Yeah. It was two other guys. And it will always be tied to their names. Yeah. Even though Musk bought them like one year into it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. And and then you got all of this money. And like, where are you going to use it? Like, you just starting something new? Do you like, I'm curious about like, after getting all of this money in your bank account, how did you like distribute it? Like, did you put like, okay, if you go to the ATFs, if you go to real estate, if you go to business, if you go to a car? We didn't touch it for one month, to be honest. Okay. It, it was like some sort of like an, obviously if something urgent would come up, we would have, but we had this internal rule, my brother and I, where we said, okay, what if we don't touch you for one month? And we're like, yeah, let's do it. Why not? We also got the uh, interest from, from WISE. WISE.com is a bank. And they give you some percentage every month based on how much cash you hold with them. A bit okay. risky because it's not a bank bank, but yeah. Yeah. What did we do? Uh, we took care of our pension. So we invested part of it in the ETF, uh, in, in ETFs. And we have some for next year tax allowance. UK does this. They allow you to invest up to 20K pounds per year tax free. Okay. So if out of those 20K you make a, b a billion dollars in 100 years, it's all tax free, and mm. it's my brother. So, but you, you need to invest in ETF. We can invest in anywhere, anywhere. Uh, when you get no, tax free, uh, or it needs to be specific things. Uh, I don't know. Bitcoin. It's, it, it, no, no, it can't be Bitcoin. It can't be. I, it's it's major stuff, like big stuff. Like I I I do ETFs and bonds, so it's stuff yeah. like that. I don't think you can do anything because it's only a couple of providers, I think, that are approved, and those mm -hmm. won't allow you to invest in Bitcoin. Okay. Or your friend's startup, because then you do money laundering, I suppose. But um, yeah, I only looked at big stuff. So it's 20K per year. And it's 40K because this is my brother and I, and we are communists in the family when it comes to family. 
So uh, yeah, we did that. We maxed our allowance. And with the rest of the money, yeah, we're looking at more real estate. But uh, I just want to divest it in a SaaS acquisition. What and do you do with real estate? Oh, just investing in flats, really. It's not, it's not that much. You I, just buy, buy a flat and like rent it? Yeah, pretty much. Buy to buy to rent, uh, buy to let. Sorry, but do you, do you buy it like all, money like all the way, or just like get a, a loan Cash. from the bank? Cash. Yeah. Cash. Okay. I could do loan and leverage myself, but I've got my trauma from my parents, so I'm trying yeah. to avoid it. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. that's something. That, but yeah, I mean, I understand. Um, now, I now that these days, also with the the, I don't know. At least here in Portugal, the banks are you know, the interests are really interest high, but. Could, is that like, I don't know, I'm just, you know, bouncing ideas with you. Is that smart? Because sure, normally sure. You, if you buy a flat, it, it will not devalue. I mean, unless you just do a terrible, uh, you know, acquisition. Yeah. Um, would that make sense? Because then with, with, let's say, 100K or 200K, you can buy three flats instead of like one flat, for instance. Uh, to, to be honest, the, the, only re the main reason why I bought flats to rent is because the yields aren't fantastic when you compare it to investing in the S&P yeah, or ETF yeah, yeah, yeah. over a long enough horizon of uh, investment horizon. The reason why I did it was because I, so I rent, I'm team rent, I'm not team buy. So uh, I rent because the yields that I get from the flats I rent, so the, the flats where I'm a landlord, mm -hmm. I use that rent to pay my rent because... Right. I'm looking for deals when I buy flats and I got them at a great yield. Let's just say X percent. Let's just say 2X percent. Mm -hmm. And the flat that I'm renting, this very house that I'm in now, is only at X, so half the yield. Yeah. So with, Because it's in a better area or it's exactly. something that you're more comfortable with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, but there's also more risk on, on the flats that I bought. So it, it evens out. So instead of sinking two times the amount in this flat, I only sank half that amount into those flats and I'm moving the rent and whatever. So that's why I invested in real estate as a way to go into a different asset class. M my choice of risk and performance and whatever. But it makes sense because S&P or like ETFs are better, but it's just different, you know, investment. You just want to put your eggs in multiple baskets. Exactly. If you look at 2018 or 2016 or whatever, there was a year where you had like minus 5%. But the next year mm -hmm. was 30% up. So it, you just have to have that long enough investment horizon. I, I went into real estate because I, I thought to myself, okay, if some year maybe I'm not liquid, maybe something happens, let's just, even though I might be making less on, on flats, and that's yeah. fine because you diversify, it's in the same asset class as the house that I'm renting. So if it goes down, my rent will also go down. And it's, okay. uh, it, it's, it's what made me comfortable. And the, the house, it's always like, You're always getting money out of the rent, whereas the ETF, it might be the, like, okay, if I need money, I cannot take it right now because it's the market is down, makes no sense. Exactly. Whereas the rent, you're always, you know, taking money, is that it? Exactly. There's always some okay. cash flow. And Smart. some people say that ETFs are not liquid. They are. You could sell tomorrow. I mean, it might take three days, but for me, anything you can withdraw in less than a week is still close to cash. But as you said, yeah. you might be withdrawing, but maybe the market landscape is bad. And you need monthly cash flow to pay for your groceries or yeah, yeah, yeah something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So do you, do you always keep some some money in in uh, in an account that you can easily access? Like, do you have like a pure cash? You mean? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's the, the we have cash now because we're looking to do an acquisition, and yeah, uh, we have to be ready to pay for it. But um, other than that. I don't know because I'm safety just, nets. I don't know. I, I'm just wondering. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If you have... yeah. But personally, and with the company, like I try to keep a few months, you know, in case tomorrow Stripe and my banks are getting blocked. Because look at what yeah. happened in Russia and Ukraine. Some people yeah, had right. that, and it's a black swan event. But what if you get blocked? Yeah. Um. So maybe that something like shit like that happens. Yeah, I keep a couple of months just in case. And to be honest, I don't know how to answer the question because we recently got a lot of liquidity from the exit because it was an all cash deal. So after the acquisition with the leftover money, you know, we maxed out our investment uh, quota. Maybe we'll invest more beyond the quota. Maybe we'll do something. I don't know yet. But okay. uh, yeah, I, I like to keep cash because I'm paranoid like that, as I said. Yeah, it's smart. Uh, I mean, it uh, makes sense. Mm -hmm. I also think everyone has to have some, you know, if they can, have some hard paper cash 
just in case something happens and you yeah, just have yeah. to leave your house in an emergency. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, tell me about taxes, which is something that is extremely annoying, at least for me here in, in Portugal. Um, oh, yeah. Do you have any... Like, how do you set up your companies? Or I, mean, I don't know, maybe go too much into details. It's also sometimes a sensitive topic, but... I don't know, any tips, any tricks? How do you see the world of Texas in, in general? Like, You know, I think it's down to personality. I pay tax and I don't look to my... I ask my accountant, like, hey, can we optimize? In a, like, please tell me what we can optimize out of what you know. Now, my accountant is not somebody that works in the Cayman Islands for 40 years and they know every single thing about moving money around. So I don't have the work and I don't need... If there's anything low effort we can do, fine. Like, I'm not going to pay more tax just because. But other than that, I'm not looking to over-optimize because the, the way I am as a person, what motivates me isn't specifically... So if you tell me now, look, disputes, Stripe disputes. Have you mm -hmm. been through Stripe disputes so far? Uh, yes. Do you... I mean, I did as well uh, for a period of time, but right now I don't handle Stripe disputes anymore. I just... Or I don't even accept them. I just let them there. Unless it's, at one point we had Stripe Dispute for 2000 and we I did the work. I hated it. We we won and I was surprised. But Stripe Dispute for a certain amount of money, that doesn't motivate me. If I'm saving money, I mean, I like saving money, but if I'm doing, if I'm spending 30 minutes to save $100, I'm not, that doesn't motivate me. I might be right. doing it if I need to, obviously, but I'm more... Uh, Motivated by why, what I can produce, what I can create. I like okay. efficiency too. So anyway, the point I'm making is with taxes, it wouldn't feed me if I'm spending some serious amount of time and I'm saving X percent or this amount of money. Right. If Maybe if I'm doing 10 million a year and I'm saving a million a year and I, I'll be thinking, shit, I can buy a new house mm -hmm. every year if I'm doing this. Maybe then, yes. But at the moment, I'm pretty I'm pretty okay with you know paying the tax that I pay and okay. it's... You know, it's ethics as well, I suppose. It, there's a discussion around that. And um, yeah, I was helped, I guess. I'm, I'm not dying to pay money, uh, to pay tax. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not looking to pay the least amount ever. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should do that. Obviously, don't overdo it because um, it might be used in the wrong place by the government. But yeah, I, I just don't think too much about it. Right. Is the what, What's the tax rate in... You're in the UK? Uh, right. I, I, I'm both in the UK and Romania legally. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I pay tax in both places. Let me okay. think. Corporate tax, 16% and 19%. Um, yeah, and then dividend tax. Yeah, it, it's tiered in the UK. It's flat in Romania. I just pay it. I just look at, okay. And how much is it? 8% um, plus 8 some yeah. shit in Romania. And then it's tiered in, uh, you could even get up to 40% plus in the UK for dividends. Okay, but, but it's tiered. All right. Yeah. Uh, in Portugal, it's the, the company rate is 22% and then the, the dividend is flat and it's 28%. I know you get taxed like shit in Portugal. Like You get taxed a so lot. So that's you? crazy. Yes. I mean, 28% flat rate, it's crazy. I mean, 8% is fine. 28 is crazy. <laughs> Come oh, on. Yeah. Like... That plus the, the company tax, you know, it, it adds up to almost, you know, 50. And don't you have income tax mm. as well? Oh, yeah, you get tiered. Yeah, I'm looking now. Yeah, you, the income tax, you get tiered at the IRS. But, I mean, I don't get that because Shit, I have the company. 48% at most. Yeah. Fuck. That, that's like UK. Because UK gets up to 45%, they say. But it's 45% plus some shit. And you get over 45%. Right. No, but yeah. I like the idea of the tiered dividend share. That makes sense. I don't know what are, what are the tiers, but I don't know if you are getting like let's say twenty k. Uh, it, it's it's tiered based on how much you earn, like income tax. So you can all um, oh, if you place. yeah if you make money in the salary, but also self employed, that also counts towards. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So eight point seventy five percent that I could tell you thirty three point seventy five and then thirty nine point thirty five percent. Wow. Let's That's just crazy. say, look, you get you get taxed at thirty nine point thirty five percent if you make more than one hundred twenty five k pounds per year, but okay. it can also be salary, um, self employed income. Okay, everything aggregated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, uh, you just want to uh, invest your time, and I guess it's like my my last question and my last uh, 
thing that I want to know, which is you have the CH group, right? You call the CH group, which is a holding company, yep. and you have like multiple stuff. You have some some of your SaaS, you have real estate, you, you want to do some investment. How do you like manage your time? Right? Because you cannot get too operational, right? You need to manage yeah. a lot of stuff. So I, I'm just curious about like like what percentage go to operations, like what percentage go to like research, what percentages go to um just you know planning and if there's other things that I'm you know missing out like that you, mm -hmm. that you do. Uh, the big answer is I don't know because I just wake up and I work out on either whatever has to be handled, but I, I try to structure so that if if I wake up and I say I don't feel like working today, I can just not work for you know for sensible periods of time. At the same time, it's like you know when you have a luxury, you don't make of make use of it as much. I'll give an example with vacations. I can go on multiple vacations a year. But that doesn't feed me, and I just don't really go on too many vacations. I go on vacations when friends make plans, and they invite me, and I'm like piggybacking their plans. But otherwise, I'm yeah. never the one to say, let's go on vacation, or I need a vacation. It's a human thing. When you have access to something, and you know you keep on having access to it for the short-term period of time, you don't make of use, of use of it that much. Kind of like gym. You get an unlimited subscription. You don't go <laughs> every day just because you can. I mean, you could, but you're like, What's the point of it? Yeah. Or if you have unlimited dessert. Okay, that's a great example. If you have all you can eat unlimited uh, desserts, you won't be doing that because you, it just takes away the value. Like the, the, the eighth cookie doesn't taste the same as the second one. You get that diminishing right. return. Uh -huh. So um, back to the main topic, how I structure it. I just wake up and work on whatever has to be handled or whatever I, I want to handle in that order because sometimes stuff has to be handled. And uh, that also ties into, I, I would only be looking to start stuff that doesn't require me to, or my brother, to work on actively, like an okay. agency. But now because we sold the company, I said, shit, I want to start an agency for a bit. You have a few clients, and we did. And now we're fully booked, or maybe you have one <laughs> slot. I don't know, I have to check. But uh, we have some clients, and it's, it's stupid. We, we do SEO work for very little money. Um, and I just made it so that it's, it pays the rent and it's, you know, that income. But are your tasks like more operational? Like, do you uh, do like design tasks or product development? Or are you like more thinking about, I don't know, in Strat like more strategy, strategy yes. And, and the bigger, bigger picture kind of tasks. Much like any human, I prefer strategy because Who doesn't like sitting on their ass and telling people what to do? But yeah, sometimes I do design. Sometimes I do, I write specs like product management. Like okay. this button here does that and I want this to happen and whatever. Sometimes I just do management. I talk to, to the developers and that's operational. Okay. Sometimes you do boring shit like accounting, you fit paperwork, stuff like that. But that's very rare, hopefully. So let, let's, let's go back to like maybe this past week, like what, what percent or like past months, whatever, yeah. what percentage would be, you know, operational or like really like dealing with a product and doing design? Uh, this past week is a bit weird because we started due diligence for an acquisition. Hopefully it goes okay. through, fingers crossed. Hopefully everything is fine. So that took most of the time and it was just talking, sending messages back okay. and forth. So Let, let's go like last month. Like, let, let's okay. just like, Think about like just to, uh, just to see how do you like put everything into bucket. So, what like ten percent operational, fifty percent strategizing. I would say twenty percent operational. Okay. Forty percent product and stuff like this because there's always a certain developer that maybe finished something where they need you know more right. information. So most of it goes there. Oh, what are we up? Sixty percent, ten percent paperwork and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then just exploring new stuff, the rest of it, which is what, 30%, I think? Yeah, so exploring 30%. new stuff could be, could be, I was looking for companies. That's what I was doing most in the, okay. in the last month. Um, but looking for new stuff what could are also you, be... What, what are you looking for in companies? Like what, what would be a great investment for you? You also approached, that, approached me because you, you yeah. saw some interesting pod squeeze, right? So yeah. uh, what, what, what was interesting for you in pod squeeze? First of all, I need to be able to afford it. So it has to be between a certain... Brackets of MRR. Right. Sometimes you can mm. see, I know some great companies I would want to acquire, but they're doing millions and I don't. So no way right. I could do it. 
Um, what I like, what I liked about pot squeeze is, so, and this is really the stepping stone for me. I, I, I want to be liking the industry and the prospect. So right. um, l- let me say it practically and then I'll try to m- make it abstract. I like the fact that it's in the podcasting industry. I think podcasting is going to be here in the next two and 10 years. Mm. I think you can make it into a low churn, long-term investment. I think okay. because, so I, I'm not buying AI. If I see AI, I don't look because I don't know if it's going to be, I mean, I think it's going to be there, but it just, you have to be very smart and I, I don't want to have to be very smart. And I, <laughs> I would rather want to be very, aim to be very smart in different areas. Now, podcasting, because of how it's set up, I think it could be the kind of company where you could leave it after a certain point. You could leave it be for three months because you just found the love of your life in Bali and you just want to be a romantic. Yeah. And it, it might keep on working because it's podcasting or an even greater example, website hosting. If you do podcast hosting, it's about the thing, which is what I like. But people, yeah, people just find, treat website hosting as the holy grail. So I, I, I want to I love the industry and the long-termness of it. This is really what I like. Mm-hmm. Website hosting is great. Something or, uh, that you're passionate about, something that uh, will yield not crazy results, but you know, stable results uh, without you having to put a lot of you know, time and effort into it. That's it. And I don't even, it doesn't even have to be passion. I, in fact, I would argue the opposite. The more unsexy and unpassionable it is, the more I'm getting drawn to it because I'm like, so uh, the thing is, when you buy a company, you pay a multiple on the yearly, either profits or revenue. Right. You pay anywhere between three to five. Actually, those multiples are too high in this market, but let's just say it's common. Yeah. So I give you five years of profit. Right. Can, I, can I keep it like this at minimal stuff for five years and have, you know, maybe even 10 years? Well, yes, if, it, if the company is able to be there in 10 years. Now, who knows what's going to be there in 10 years? It's not like you're buying brick and mortar like a restaurant. Yeah. But... Website hosting, you know, low churn, stuff like that. You don't have to be, you don't have to try to be very smart to do right. it. You could try to be very smart in SEO or distribution or affiliate right. systems, and that could pay off very well. But you don't have to be smart in 16 places. I can't, and I don't even want to try. Uh, I guess, yeah, cliche, but Warren Buffett buys Coca-Cola. Is Coca-Cola going to be there in 5, 10, 15, 40 years? Probably so. So... Uh, time is on your side and yeah, mm-hmm. I guess you can just wait out and that's what you get for paying five years up front. And right. so that's what I'm Makes looking sense. for when I'm buying a, a company. Uh, but that's just me. Sometimes you might find an Elon Musk who buys Tesla, uh, a almost bankrupt innovation company. Worst investment possible on paper. Did he make a trillion dollar company out of it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Did it come with, with mm-hmm. no risk? Not at all. I'm not looking to do that. Okay. Or um, do you think that stra- that lower risk strategy can take you to like I don't know 10 million? Like, is that uh, reasonable? Like, because it feels that like okay, then you are at least keeping your lifestyle. That's fine and it's really cool and it's a dream for most people. Yeah. But if you are dreaming to like 10 million or 50 million, you know what uh, it is. I think people. What would you do? I think people dream for 10 million, but they dream for 10 million a certain way. It's the same mistake that I do, used to do more, but I still do. When you compare yourself to someone, when you look at an artist and say, look at them, right. they have X, Y, Z. You, one makes a mistake if they get jealous or envy because you take one aspect from them, one stone from Thanos' gauntlet, and you put it in your yeah. life, but you keep all your rest. You keep your great family, you keep your friends, you keep your lack of trauma from childhood. You don't get the whole package from the artist. That's a mistake because nothing is perfect on this planet. So 10 million. People think of 10 million but, and they imagine the same stress-free lifestyle they might have at one certain moment and, you know, disregard all the other shit. So 10 million and a stressful life and I work as an, an investment banker, I, I, I just have a basket of, 10 SaaS products, and they're all very stressful, and I have also an agency, fuck no, I'm fine like this. 10 million growing comfortably, steadily, month over month and whatever, sure, but it's not going to be, I'm not going to be doing that next year or in two years. Right. So personally, I stopped, I stopped looking at numbers when I uh, looked at how much do I need 
And for the record, I'm not doing millions a year. For the record, like I'm not doing a lot of money. It's not like I'm I'm saying this making 10 million or even 1 million a year. But I don't need a lot. I have aspirations like it would be nice to get like a sports car or whatever. I didn't get one. I was mm-hmm. able to, you know, with the acquisition money. But as long as some stuff is being taken care of, uh, that's fine. And as long as I have, so what's something that I need and others don't, I have friends who don't think this way. If I have that pension, even though I'm 26, or if I have that foundation of, you know, look, the flats, I have the flats. So if shit hits the fan and I, I can't be paying rent anymore, I'll just, just believe I'll yeah. believe in one of my flats. That gives me comfort. Some people don't need that comfort. Some people drive without a, uh, how do you call that? The seat belt. Mm-hmm. Without a, thank you. Without the seat belt and they're on their phone and they drive with one hand. I can't yeah. be doing that because I'll be going crazy <laughs> from the stress and I'll, I'll die at 50 because of the stress. Uh-huh. But that's me. So back to the question about 10 million. Oh, I, it would be fine. It, it would be, you know, when you make money, you have more possibilities because Money is actually that, the way I look at it. It's, you have options, you have possibilities, you have time. You can buy somebody else's time to clean your house instead of you cleaning it. You have endless possibilities when you have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't want these to come at the expense of, look, I would be dying if I'd be running an agency where uh, there's fires to be put out everywhere. And I can't take yeah. that day off when I don't feel like working. So this is why I have these criteria, even the ones I've given for the for the company. And I'm sure you, Tiago, would would agree with me because I, I I mean I don't know you, but I know we are about the same in some some of these foundational mm. principles. Like you, I f- have the feeling after you had the job and you said, you know, a job can drain the soul out of you. You wouldn't be running a SaaS company where it would be draining, or an agency where that would be draining your soul. Mm. Yeah. Um, no, I think. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation because I feel that you have a lot of things more figured out than I do, even though you're younger, which is really cool. Uh, the whole like I'm still figuring because I only found su- success with Podsquiz recently, so but that's I'm still great. figuring out like what now, like what what does it mean, what what it means to be an entrepreneur, like where should I invest my money, and w- a lot of things that you just said uh, I identify myself with. I think they make a lot of sense, and and I've learned a lot. So I appreciate uh, you, Daniel, for you know taking the time as well to chat here with uh, in the podcast. Because again, it was a great opportunity for me to learn and gave me a lot of food for thought uh, to apply to into my own business. And I'm sure here also for the one of the entrepreneur it. listeners too. I appreciate. So thank I, I you learned, very much. I learned a lot, but I just want to take a second to thank you for you know making this conversation flow. I feel like. So for the record, for people listening, this is the first time Tiago and I have have spoken you know through voice yeah. for video. It sounds like we knew each other for a long, not for a long, but it, is, it sounds as if it was the first conversation, and that's that's uh, your credit and your credit solely for you know facilitating the space for this conversation. So thank you for that. I learned I learned as well, and uh, yeah, we should Thanks, do this Daniel. again sometime. And that's the wrap of my conversation with Daniel. One thing that I took from this is the fact that he's so chilled with his investment. I mean, he doesn't really care to grow like crazy and have houses and private jets no he wants to grow steadily and safely and that's something that i feel goes really well with the bootstrapping and indie makings lifestyle but doesn't fit with the vc lifestyle often we see that what investors want what vc founders want is that growth that hockey stick growth and unicorns and everything So it's all or nothing. Whereas for makers, it's not really like that. In the end, what I've been realizing is that even though money is something that I want to achieve, it's not my priority. To be honest, we don't really need a lot of money to live happily. If you make a good salary, if you are able to take a good salary out of your company, you mostly can live a very decent life. So that's what I've learned with Daniel, is to invest my money carefully. Don't go for huge returns with high risk so that you can conquer the world with your Lamborghinis and private jets and mansions. No, just get whatever you need to live a comfortable lifestyle and don't put money as a priority. Put your comfort, put your relationships and maybe even changing the world and and making the world a better place. That's much more a priority for me than getting a Lamborghini. 
I hope you learned as much as I did with this conversation. I will bring more chats and more interviews in the future. I have already a few planned out and they will be really, really cool. And it will be all in this topic. How to invest your money, how to grow your business, how to make your business or take your business to the next step and make a healthy, fun to run business. So just stay tuned. Every Monday, I'll be releasing another episode, either interviews or me just talking. But yeah, every Monday will be here. So this was another wannabe entrepreneur. See you next Monday.